close on day three of our November event. It's the Ellen McCarthy Foundation's interactive online series of events that explores the circular economy through disruptive stories, ideas, and showing showing examples of innovation and action. Uh, my name is Seb, and I'm the diff host of this session, although I am shortly about to hand over to Gwen and Helen from Circular Economy, who will be guiding the discussion. But my biggest role actually in this session will be ensuring that you guys get your say and that your comments and questions are fed through to our speakers today. Um, and there are a few different ways in which you can share those questions with us. The main two are by posting on the right hand side of the comments feature on the thinkdiff.co website or by, um, if you've already navigated through to the YouTube page, you can put it in the chat there. Um, do use hashtag thinkdiff on Twitter if you're watching the session and share comments and thoughts there as well. Uh, and today's uh, session is focusing on fashion. The problems and challenges and the negative effects of the fashion industry are well advertised, well known, all over the front pages and headlines of much of our media. But what we're talking about here at the Diff is the hope. And uh, one thing that I always think about the fashion industry is that surely an industry that's full of invention and innovation is too inventive to be stuck in a take, make, waste, linear trap. And I know that today our host, Circular Economy, have pulled together a panel of people who are actively working on the front frontier of one of the most promising places of innovation in fashion, re-commerce, rental, fashion models. Um, so uh, Gwen, Helen, um, tell us, what who have you brought uh, online today? Hi, uh, hello there. This is Gwen and I'm joined by Helen. Hi. And as Seb introduced, thank you Seb, we'll be uh, guiding the discussion today on the topic of a new consumption model. So the rise of rental and re-commerce in the fashion industry in recent years. And maybe just to kick off, I'll give a very brief introduction to Circle Economy and the work of the textiles program to give some context. Um, so Circle Economy, we are a social enterprise working out of Amsterdam on the practical and scalable implementation of the circular economy. And the textiles program uh, was started in 2014 as the first sector specific program within the organization. And we have the mission to achieve a zero waste industry. Um, and we do this in two ways. So on one hand, we look at how do you uh, reduce the textile waste mountain that's already in existence um, through the development of new technology, data and infrastructure to valorize textile waste at end of use. And on the other hand, we really take a more proactive approach and we look at how do you prevent waste in the first place? And there we work mostly with brands to help them assess and adopt uh, circular strategies. And circular business models for us are one of these key circular strategies that really will help us achieve that second uh, goal. Um, and I suppose the need for them, the need for a new way of consuming is, uh, well, more needed than ever before. Um, because what we see at the moment is that there, you know, in the past two decades with the rise of fast fashion especially, has been quite a, a dramatic decrease in, in what we call the practical service life of clothing. So how long it is actually worn compared to the technical service life of clothing, which is how long it could be worn for. Uh, we also know, for instance, that the consumer today is buying roughly 60% more clothing than they used to and keeping their clothes for half as long. And we uh, see some quite shocking statistics saying that up to 70% of uh, an average closet can go unworn. So we, we also recognize that, you know, extending the active service life of clothing is one of uh, the most effective ways to reduce this impact um, on two fronts. Uh, firstly, it really reduces that textile waste mountain. And secondly, hopefully, if done in the right way, it can potentially reduce or displace the need for the production of new garments and the consumption of new garments. And that's what we're gonna be uh, unpacking today with some of our panelists. Um, apart from the environmental gain of these models, there's also quite a big commercial gain, which is you know, catching the attention of many innovators, but also of brands. Um, the re-commerce market, for instance, is set to double in the coming uh, five years. It's now at a value of uh, 20 billion US dollars, and that's going to grow to 40 billion US dollars, uh, growing at a pace much greater than the traditional retail uh, market. 
Um, and some reports even saying that within 10 years, it will outpace uh, the fast fashion market. Rental is a little bit of a different animal. It's a much smaller uh, market today. It's estimated at around one billion US dollars, but still within five years, that's set to grow to 1.8. So also uh, very promising. And so while kind of we always think of it as the kind of the why of these models is fairly recognized, but the how, how do you actually implement these in practice is still yet to be discovered. And that's what the Switching Gear project uh, is trying to do. Yeah, Switching Gear um, is a CNA Foundation supported project led by us, Circle Economy, um, that supports four apparel brands uh, in the design and launch of a rental or a re-commerce uh, business model pilot by 2021. Um, to support this practical implementation of these pilots by the brands, but also to enable a wider uptake of circular business models in the apparel industry. Um, we have joined forces with a strategic partner, Fashion for Good, to drive the formation of a powerful global switching gear enabling network, um, which is over 50 circular solution providers, innovators, front running brands um, and relevant experts. And we will run this in the coming uh, two years. Since launching this network uh, in May 2019, over 30 organizations have already joined, including Eileen Fisher, Gibbon, Reflant, Repack, Stuffster, The Next Closet, Renewal Workshop, Yurdle, Circular Fashion, Monochain, ThreadUp, Oxfam Ireland, and TechSaid, to name a few. Um, and the network's shared objectives are to build knowledge, um, sharing the learnings and insights that um, are there already from experience, matchmaking, connecting brands with the circular solution providers and innovators, but also to create exposure. So elevating really the topic of this re-commerce and rental uh, to the global industry agenda. Today, we are thrilled to uh, have uh, three great panelists on board that are part of the Switching Gear Enabling Network. Um, and I will give the word to them to introduce themselves and the work that they do briefly. Um, starting with uh, John Atchison from Stuffster. John. Hi, thanks, Helen. Um, it's great to be here. So um, let me just give a, a quick introduction to Stuffster. So Stuffster is a social enterprise. Uh, we have a vision statement of no unused stuff. So everything we do is focused on trying to make sure that products are used fully and then reprocessed and used again. And the way we go about doing that is by providing what we call embedded re-commerce. So we have a platform for instant buyback that integrates into the um, apps and websites of brand and retail partners. So it's a completely integrated solution where I can pull up my retail app, I can see my last five years of purchases, and every single one of those purchases is stamped with an instant buyback price. So a price that, that we'll pay right then and there to acquire that item. And so you can just tap these items on your phone. You can say, I'm ready. And then we will actually send a courier instantly to your door to pick these items up for free. Um, and as soon as we receive them, we'll transmit to you an e-gift card for that amount from the originating retailer. So the whole process is focused on trying to essentially eliminate the friction of re-commerce. So that it's just, a, it, it's as easy to recirculate your things and put them to good use and get value for them as it is to let them pile up in your closet for months or years and then finally try to take a Sunday afternoon and pull them together and drive them down to the, to the uh, landfill. So that's what we're doing. We just recently launched um, a big project called Infinite Play with Adidas here in the UK. Um, so we're now gathering all the used Adidas gear um, and bringing that in. Um, and we are um, you know, very, very focused on trying to ultimately capture everything. And, and I think it's important to say that we, we take everything. So we even promote the idea of even old socks. So we want people to think holistically that everything I buy from this retailer, this is where it goes when I'm done with it. And it's gonna be some kind of residual value. It may only be 20p for a pair of old socks, but we're gonna get some kind of residual value for these things and be able to put them to use. And so when we get them, our focus is on reselling everything that can possibly be resold. And if it can't be resold, then we responsibly recycle it. Great, thank you so much, John. Sure. Um, now it's up to Samantha Blumenthal of ThreadUp to introduce yourself. 
Hi there, I'm Sam Blumenthal from ThreadUp. I'm the Senior Manager of Marketing Communications here. Um, and ThreadUp is the world's largest fashion resale platform. So very similarly to Stuffster, we are on a mission to extend the life of every single garment. And our goal is always to get items into the hands of consumers who will reuse them. We think that's the best possible way to keep items out of a landfill. And then anything that we cannot accept and resell, we responsibly recycle. And our mission is to inspire a new generation to think secondhand first. We've done a lot of work over the past few years to work on removing the stigma around secondhand. Um, there used to be some apprehension around shopping used clothes, but by reinventing resale on the internet and inventing this cutting edge technology to process your clothing, uh, to price it, to list it online, to make it really, really easy to find the perfect item that you're looking for. We've, we've done a great job of eliminating that stigma and helping secondhand to go mainstream. And so we make it really easy with technology to both clean out and refresh your closet with secondhand clothing. We accept 35,000 brands. Uh, so that's everything from Gap to Gucci, your everyday items, your fast fashion items, and then also your luxury items. We also recently launched a platform to power resale experiences for retailers, which we're very excited about. We see that as the future of not just resale, but really the future of retail. And to date, we've partnered with such brands as Macy's, Reformation, and Madewell. Thank you so much, Samantha. Um, and then finally, I would like to give the word to Jeff Demby, uh, the co-founder of the Renewal Workshop. Hi there. Yeah, I'm the co-founder of Renewal Workshop along with Nicole Bassett. And um, the Renewal Workshop uh, exists to help uh, brands become uh, circular and so really we're focused on serving um, our brand partners to help transition their linear business models into circular business models. And we do that in a number of ways. First, by helping them to develop the strategy behind um, switching over to um, a circular business model, which is incredibly challenging and difficult for a business that has been built for linearity. Um, but then we manage the entire backend operations uh, for a brand, including all of the processing of the products that they deem as um, unsellable or that they've received through take back programs, um, much like the ones that um, John runs. But um, we have uh, facilities in Oregon and now in Amsterdam where we take this product in, we sort it, we clean it, we um, can repair anything that's wrong with the product and return that product back to like new condition and certify it to the quality of the original brand standards. Um, we also manage all of the data associated with the um, product at the product level for re-commerce and then manage the re-commerce sites for the brands so that they can actually own the resale of their own product and benefit it from it financially and both um, from a customer engagement and relationship standpoint. Um, anything that we can't renew, we um, manage the recycling of through textile recyclers. So it's a total zero waste system that, that we have. Nothing ever goes to landfill or incineration and it's all used for innovation in the textile industry. Um, and we also calculate the impact metrics for brands so that brands know the amount of carbon, water, chemicals, and landfill that they're diverting by um, renewing product rather than making um, new product. The goal is to grow revenues for brands, not to make more product. And so we're helping brands understand that um, there's a different new way to grow revenue that is not about just making more things. And so that's really our whole focus is really getting our brand partners um, of which key partners include the North Face, uh, Mara Hoffman, uh, Kos in Europe and brands like Prana and Carhartt as well in um, the US. Thank you so much, Jeff, and all of you for the introduction. Some 
interesting things already coming up that will be part of the discussion uh, uh, later on. So actually, that's the moment to start kicking off this discussion. Um, this is going to be with you, the panelists, but also with the audience. So please, um, uh, as Div said, enter your questions and we'll be taking these questions throughout the discussion. So time to kick off. Um, and firstly, <clears throat> we're talking a little bit about the, the brand perspective. So we're seeing a considerable uptake of circular business models by established apparel brands at the moment, um, such as John Lewis, Urban Outfitters, Reformation. And I'd like to start maybe asking the question to, to John, um, why do you think apparel brands are so interested in these circular business models at the moment? What are some of these key drivers um, for uptake? Sure. Well, I think one of the key drivers right now is consumers. I think consumers have become increasingly aware of the. <laughs> are you okay? <laughs> increasingly, increasingly aware of the issues involved in fashion and how much fashion is going to landfill right now, and I think particularly younger consumers are really demanding a solution. They want to be part of a solution, and so most of the brands and retailers we talk to are really getting that kind of bottom-up pressure that they feel very acutely this need to have a solution, to find some way to um, help people recirculate these things. Um, you know, I think uh, kind of going on what Jeff was just saying, I think that the brands are also realizing that there is revenue to be had here, that this is something that actually can enhance their business and, and make it a richer business. Um, and I think another key driver that we found is just the whole notion of kind of customer loyalty. I mean, to be able to kind of bring customers in and be able to hold on to them. I mean, the notion of, uh, and, you know, just looking at the kind of standard model of retail for so many years now of having, you know, a customer come into your store, buy something, and then you literally stand at the door and kind of wave goodbye, as opposed to actually helping them with that product and helping them recirculate that product in some way, be it through e-commerce or rental um, to be, you know, reusing it just doesn't make any sense. And so, Usually, um, we will get kind of pulled into the loyalty teams and be able to work with those loyalty teams to um, to really kind of enhance those programs and get customers involved for the long term. Thanks, John. Very clear. And I mean, these are really great uh, drivers, but obviously they're will also be barriers. And maybe Samantha, you can reflect on what do you see actually as some of the barriers uh, for brands to um, enter in this space? Things that we've heard like cannibalization or other things that are stopping brands from actually uh, doing this. Yeah, well, first of all, I do 100% agree with what John's saying. I think that this is something the consumer is driving and, and brands are finally responding, which is amazing to see. And we know from ThreadUp's 2019 resale report that nine in 10 retail executives want to get involved in resale or rental, some sort of circular experience, but they don't know how to do that. And so ThreadUp, for example, has spent the past 10 years building an infrastructure, serving consumers um, to process clothing, to, um, to quality check it, to price it, to list it online. And we're actually processing 100,000 items of clothing every single day. So that means we receive them, we evaluate them, um, we use automated photography and pricing algorithms to, to price them and list them online. So that's something that took us many years to get to a place where we felt ready to open up our infrastructure and technology and allow retailers to plug into it. So I think that that is, is really difficult, if not honestly impossible, for most retailers to try to do retroactively. And it's much easier for them to partner um, with someone like ThreadUp, who's an expert in the space, who can help them launch these programs at scale. And I, to um, the other part of your question about cannibalization, I know that that's a really big fear, but I will say that, first of all, just anecdotally at ThreadUp, we see often that our customers will use secondhand as a gateway to discover new brands, uh, to try them out a little bit more risk-free. They can access brands they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or wouldn't necessarily want to invest in upfront. 
But then once they discover these brands and, and see the quality firsthand and learn that they love it, they become full price buyers as well and go direct to the brand. Um, and then more specifically in our case studies with retail partnerships, we have seen that customers are returning to stores more frequently. Um, they're spending more with those retailers. Um, and in the case of our recycling program with Reformation, we're, we're really fueling um, the, the constant refresh of consumers' closets with their favorite brands like Reformation that they love even more as a result of them implementing this program. So I know that that's a concern, but everything points to that um, that brands should not should not be worried about cannibalization. And the last thing I'll say on on that point, the way that we think about it at ThreadUp is that um, the retail industry is very similar to the used car industry. So you think about a few years ago, used cars were a little bit taboo; they were sold off the lot. Um, but now it's really commonplace and easy to trade in your old car and shop both um, certified pre-owned cars and new cars in the same space and make the choice that works best for you. Thank you, Samantha. And um, re definitely recognize the, the barrier that you mentioned that brands will ha have difficulty developing these capacities uh, and in these processes on their own and therefore they really need partners to plug into which is great uh, why all of you exist um, and <clears throat> um, on your cannibalization answer I think that's something that we'll come back to on the impact question as well um, so maybe final like rounding up this this topic um, uh, because of time and having a final question for for Jeff on that um, how do you kind of deal with um, with these processes that you kind of have to plug into uh, a brand um, seamlessly to be able to provide this, this solution for them. And also maybe reflecting on the, um, the end of life or let's say the things that you cannot resell um, because we've got a question from the audience on that. Uh, what does responsible recycling mean? Um, and um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think what's really important is like we're seeing a huge um, appetite from brands now who recognize the changing marketplace and that they want to recapture and own the secondhand e-commerce marketplace for themselves. And so as brand, as we know, brands don't own their own manufacturing. It's all outsourced. And so they don't have the capacity to run operations and most of them outsource the distribution of their product. So the, the recapture of that product back into a system that needs to then sort it, clean it, repair it, certify it is one that they don't have the operations to manage. And so that's what the Renewal Workshop was created for, was specifically to do that for the brands. And the really key part of this is that brands never designed product to have the data associated with that product continue with the life of that product. And so all we get is the style number on a product that, and we have to rely on what the available data is. And so at the Renewal Workshop, we've really worked with a lot of brands to develop a proprietary processing system to integrate the data associated with product, everything from the original price point to the features and benefits, all to the material content into our system so that we can use that in re-commerce. And that whole piece is really um, a key aspect of what we offer brands to be able to develop their own custom e-commerce sites. Um, and so the, that's the part where we really become a value add um, uh, service provider for them because they can't do this operation themselves. And it's not their business. This is our business every day. Their business is design and, and, um, and sales. Now on the, on the aspect of product that we can't renew, and the concept of responsibly recycle. This is a piece that we take really seriously because um, I think that the word recycle is thrown around to not be very clear in the market for consumers of what that actually means. And recycle means that we take the product, whatever it might be, like an aluminum can, and we turn that back into the constituents of an aluminum can and use that aluminum to make another aluminum can. Like that's, recycling and so we don't really have very much capacity to truly recycle clothing which would mean breaking that product down into the fiber 
and then re-spinning that fiber and turning it back into a new fiber that can make new clothing. So that's like recycling. Um, it's a really new industry in the um, textile world. And so what we do is anything that we can't recycle, we separate by material types. And then we work with textile recyclers around the world to get that product into their recycling system to turn it back into a fiber. And our system's able to track that for a brand so that they could then actually track down back into their supply system into the, re the manufacture of new product from their old product, which ultimately is the true definition of circularity because nothing is going to landfill. Everything is actually that's old that can't be used is now becoming a new product again. And anything that we can't recycle, we work with those recyclers on innovation. So if it's a mixed product or it's like got a coating or something like that, we don't have a recycling solution for that that's at an industrial scale anywhere really in the world. So we're working with multiple recyclers around the world to be like, hey, this like, you know, North Face jacket that we can't renew, how do we actually turn this back into a fiber? And that's the future that we need to invest in and develop because that's where circularity and the business model and the structural change really happens. Great, thank you so much. Um, I mean, we could go into that in so much more depth. Yeah. <laughs> also, how do you, you know, what is the eventual uh, interconnectivity between all of these supply chain partners that are now coming into play? So mm -hmm. how can we make sure that the work that you are doing in the space of reuse is not operating separately from the recycling space that is now, you know, up and coming, but that this really yeah, develops together and uh, exactly because we have the supply that needs to go out to these different recyclers and they're developing new technology and innovations and we need to connect into them because yeah. the part brands are our partners and we can offer them a lot of product to be able to them then create the fiber which then they can output into the marketplace or back to the original brand itself so the, it, this is a community of different technology and service providers in the same way that the supply chain for making new product is an enormous global community of everything from cotton growers to mills to cut and sews to distributors. We need to create the same sort of circular supply chain of, of suppliers and um, around the world that can do this to create so that we can stop manufacturing new product and using raw materials, but rather change over to this whole circular supply chain. Connecting again, the end with the beginning, connecting with the circular design of the product to begin with um, is the first step or the final step, <laughs> depending on which, <laughs> which angle it you never ends. It never <laughs> ends in circular, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna switch kind of the, um, well, switch gear a little bit, actually. And I want to look at the role of the consumer, which we've hinted at a little bit already. Samantha, you had this great uh, phrase, you know, that you want the consumer to think secondhand first and the kind of the stigma that we need to um, overcome in that process. And what I find very fascinating, of course, is, you know, the, the, the consumer is, as we just heard, really setting the tone or demanding these options but what we also see is oftentimes a discussion around a kind of a value action gap, whether what they ask for is really also um, uh, mimicked in how they behave. And there is a huge role for them in these systems, especially for instance, if you think of uh, a e-commerce model whereby the consumer all of a sudden is really your supplier into the system and the success of the model will depend on you know, the volume, but also the quality of what they bring back. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious to unpack this a little bit and maybe John, you could help us to understand in your experience, how do we get the consumer to really get excited about these models, but also how can we deliberately incentivize that they uh, take a very um, proactive role? Sure. You know, I think one of the most interesting things we learned at Stuffster, because Stuffster actually started all the way back in 2014, which actually seems like a millennium ago to us, <laughs> um, but um, but one of the things we found was that to to really get consumers to engage with all of this, it's not really a matter of reducing the friction in the process. It's actually a matter of eliminating the friction in the pro friction in the process. That um, the consumers, and we found ninety eight percent of consumers, if you give them kind of an equal 
amount of effort, they, they'll always choose the better option. They'll always do the responsible thing. Um, they'll always do something that, that feeds recirculation, but you've got to get it so that it's an even, an even decision for them. Um, if it's more work or it costs them something, um, it just, it, you're only going to get the fringe players. You're not going to get the mainstream. And so the first principle that, that we pursue is just making sure that we take all the friction out of the process that can possibly be taken out of. And I think, you know, we joke around Stuffster that if we could actually go into people's homes and carry the items from the closet to the courier, we would do that um, because we think it would give a 25% uptick in the, in the response rate. Um, might be a little awkward for us, so we don't do that. But, <laughs> but that, that would be ideal if we could actually get into people's homes and make it that simple. Um, so that, that's really the, the kind of underlying foundation, I think, of, of everything that needs to go on in terms of getting consumers to engage in this and, and participate in it. Um, beyond that, obviously, we're actually giving consumers direct value in the sense that they're getting these gift cards that pay them for their things. So it's, um, and it's immediate, right? I don't have to wait around for it. I push a button and usually within one to three hours, everything's been picked up and I've gotten paid. So it's, it's a very, very kind of direct benefit that, that gets them engaged. Um, and I think just from a um, kind of qualitative standpoint, um, the partners we've worked with, John Lewis or Adidas, um, have been very good and effective at bringing consumers into this feeling of, hey, we're, we're proposing a solution together, right? That, that we're going to work together to solve this problem of fashion waste. Um, and I think that's really important. I think people need to feel that they're part of a movement, that they're part of something bigger than themselves. Thank you. And, and you bring up the example of Adidas, you know, which is a very fresh example. And of course, now there's the separate um, resale uh, platform associated with this initiative, which is kind of, um, you might say, a trend that we see. We've spoken about it already before, that many brands are really taking it on themselves to develop their own uh, brand platform, whether it's actually a white label on the background or their own, you know, it's all the same to the consumer, you might say. When you look at reducing the friction, um, how, do, how do you see that, I wonder, you know, is it easier or more difficult that now a brand uh, platform, each brand has their own separate resale platform, would it be easier for a consumer if all of this was housed on, on one platform? Is this creating, you know, too many options for the consumer? something uh, that maybe Jeff, you could uh, reflect on a little. Yeah, I mean, I, the way that we view it is that um, the, the opportunity for re-commerce and re re take back and recycling in re-commerce re is that um, this is a long-term engagement strategy for brands. So, um, you know, right now, I think John was mentioning before that they, a consumer buys a product and that's it. The consumer and the product leave the store or this website and that's it. But this is actually a tool for long-term engagement. And so when the customer is done with that, they should actually bring it back to the brand who values it the most and can, en and can engage in a long-term relationship with that brand. And the brand should own that customer and the brand should be able to renew and resell that product and serve the customer with either a new product or a renewed product or a rented product in a way that best um, serves that customer. And ultimately a brand wants to keep a customer within its brand ecosphere. So um, all brands have their own outlets uh, and, all, and many brands also um, wholesale to other retailers. And so I think there's a number of hybrid opportunities for brands to engage in re-commerce through um, third-party retailers but for any brand the most powerful consumer engagement is going to be directly with the brand and i think that this the renewal and re-commerce offers the brand and the customer for that long-term engagement and highest amount of value that's really interesting the way you respond there because you know it hints at the fact that well actually the consumer can wrap their head around the multitude of ways that they can buy a product firsthand. So why should they not be able to wrap their head around the multitude of ways that they can buy a secondhand uh, product? And that the experience for the consumer is quite different if it's multi-brand or if it's really tailored 
um, own brand platform. Um, and finally, you know, maybe one of the more uh, recent criticisms that you hear coming with regards to rental and e-commerce is the question on whether these models will have any rebound uh, negative effects in terms of how they could kind of excite the appetite of the consumer to actually in the end buy more. Um, something which is being floated as a theory. I don't think I've seen any uh, research which says yay or nay, uh, if you know of that, maybe you can um, speak to it now. But Samantha, given that you uh, spoke earlier about this constant refresh, maybe it's something that you'd like to lean in on and give her perspective on. Yes, I love this question. Um, so you had mentioned before, Gwen, we know that consumers are buying twice as much as they did 20 years ago and they're keeping it for half as long and this was occurring before rental and, and resale really took off um so i don't think we can say this is a result of that it's really the way that i see it a result of two factors um number one being our disposable fashion culture um so you know, we've gotten so used to social media and outfit of the day and um, just photographing every moment and feeling the societal pressure to wear something new every single day or for every single occasion. Um, and then, you know, the, the other side of that coin is the fashion industry itself. So, you know, particularly with fast fashion, they're producing more, they're producing it faster. Um, it's really cheap. So it seems like it's a good decision financially um, and it's so cheap that you don't even give it a second thought when you throw it away. So something that we feel really good about at ThreadUp is yes, people need to rethink their behavior and, and consumers need to take a step back and, and slow down the way that they consume and, and purchase and, and discard fashion. But we feel really good about the fact that by choosing secondhand, you're making a smarter, more responsible choice for both your wallet and the planet. So you can have all the fun of fast fashion. You can have sustainability without sacrifice. You can wear a different outfit every single day, as long as you're purchasing responsibly from a sustainable retailer, shopping secondhand, and you're refreshing your closet responsibly. So cleaning it out, um, not throwing it in the garbage, sending it to a reseller who will be able to do something with that clothing and get it back into the hands of someone who will use it. Um, I do think that the, the other piece of that is really, we see it as our responsibility at ThreadUp to put pressure on retailers to produce less. And so I think this is another area where we, we have open conversations and advocate a lot around just, just producing less. And if you're going to have that much waste, send it to us and we'll help you do something with it. But it really falls back into the hands of the consumer. And what you wear is so important. It makes a statement about who you are and what you believe in. And the way you spend your money is something that brands can see and respond to. So if you continue shopping with these brands, like buying fast fashion, um, they will continue making it. If you choose to shop more responsibly and shift that spend over to a model like secondhand and re-commerce, um, they, they won't be able to produce as much because people won't be buying it. Um, so we're not saying, you know, don't, we don't expect people to completely upend the way that they shop, but just small changes can make such a huge difference. Buying one used garment instead of new reduces its carbon footprint by 82%. So this year, if everyone bought just one used item instead of new, we would save nearly 6 billion pounds of carbon emissions, which is the equivalent of taking half a million cars off the road for an entire year. So we don't want it to feel overwhelming, but we like to do a lot of education around these small changes you can do that collectively make a really big impact. Thanks, Samantha. And it's <clears throat> really indeed buying secondhand or pre-loved instead of yes. new and not 
in addition to new. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You're doing doing the right thing together, and good to hear that you're inspiring or trying to put pressure on the brands. It would be really interesting to see if these models actually prove their value, and this is actually a good bridge to the next uh, topic because we're going to talk a little bit about the business case. Could it potentially um, start to substitute the primary business model of retail to a certain extent, um, which is something that we can only wait and see what happens in the future. Um, but actually, um, the business case is a very important part of this. Otherwise, brands would not enter this market. And maybe, Jeff, you can reflect a little bit on how brands uh, can actually make sure that this model has a positive business case for them. Yeah, absolutely. And we see, um, we believe, again, I'll, I'll say that the point of business is to grow revenues, not to grow the number of things that we manufacture every year. And currently the business model of the um, apparel industry is make more new things than we did last year and sell more new things than we did last year. Um, but what we are hoping to do in the circular economy is absolutely cannibalize your first price new sales. So when we talk to a brand and they say, oh, we're worried about cannibalization, we say, we're trying to cannibalize your first price sales. Because what we're trying to do is create an entirely new system for how we actually engage in apparel and the production of it and the sales of it and the recapture of it. So this is something that brands, it's we don't want to create have a linear um, apparel system that we tack a circular ball on the end of. We really want to actually bend the entire system to become linear. And so the ability, we want brands to make new products, cool new things, sell it, but design it for circularity, for recycling. And then we want them to be able to re-engage with the customer so that they can get that product back through a take back program we want to renew it and sell it to that other customer that wants to buy renewed. And if we can't renew it, we want it to go out to textile recycling where it can be recycled back into a fiber, which then can go into the development and creation of their new product. So that all becomes a circular business model that the brands can engage in. And I always say fast and fashion are not the problem. It's resource use that is the problem. Imagine we could make as much product as we wanted to over and over again to provide new and interesting products to the customer without actually ever having to use new resources from the ground. And so we don't need to grow more cotton and more oil because we have enough of it already in the form of product that just needs to be recycled. So we're really transitioning over to that, pro that sort of um, business model maybe to bring a little bit of a critical note or at least a critical question also from the audience um it's we've also seen that um uh, a way for brands to kind of follow through their dead stock or unsold stock or something like that through e-commerce platforms like how do you view that uh, versus indeed the ideal situation where a product is actually made every product that is made is used coming back and used again because now yeah. you know that might create some friction and we don't deal in any of the dead stock or overstock because that's not that's not the business that we're engaged in. We're really engaged in product that comes back from customers or is damaged in retail or whatnot. If they're overproducing stock and they have 10,000 pairs of yoga pants that they can't sell because they made too much of, there is not a great solution other than trying to mark that stuff down and sell it for as little as possible. Or right now, the majority of them are burning it or landfilling it. And so we need to find much better. We need to, that's part of their strategy in going circular is they have to get off, of, brands have to get off of this addiction to making as much stuff as possible with the hope that they can sell it there are smarter business models for them and they just need to transition over to them. We get that that's so hard for a brand, especially a public company, but we all have to get there in the industry if, we're good, if it's gonna move forward and survive. Thanks, Jeff, and um, very interesting. Also actually thinking that e-commerce and the data that is coming from e-commerce or from rental platforms can actually help to inform brands to make better decisions when it comes to planning their production and designing their products so that they are 
use this all properly. Um, shifting again to the final topic, because we're almost running out of time, which is about impact. Yeah, I mean, we've already um, indirectly touched on that a little bit, but I mean, we, we know that there is big potential with these models. The data on what exactly that potential is, is either in development or, uh, well, very little, uh, to be quite frank. We've heard some numbers already. Another, you know, key statistic that's often thrown around is that uh, if we reuse our garments um, by just an extra nine months, then we uh, will reduce the carbon, the water and the waste at the footprint by around 20 to 30 percent. Impact statistics around rental are few and far between, and I think this is really a gap that the industry needs to fill. A lot of our um, hopes around these business models are based on some, some big assumptions that it will displace the production of new product, the consumption of new product, that it will increase the utilization of new product. How should we be thinking about capturing and really uh, measuring impact in this space? Um, and maybe, John, you could reflect perhaps on how do you measure your own impact at Stuffster? Yeah, no, this is a really great question. And, you know, a, a few years ago, we worked with a very large retailer in the US and looked at what the impact would be if they actually were to actively extend the use, the average use of the things they were selling. And, um, and it was really kind of an amazing study because we found that, the, um, that they were able to extend that use by just around 20% or so, that they could actually essentially negate their entire carbon footprint as a corporation. Um, and it was, you know, an amazing finding. And they got that finding and they said, oh my gosh, I you know, can't believe that. Um, and that's all great, but how do we measure that, right? We don't have any way of measuring that. Um, and they were totally right. There's no baseline for how much a shirt is worn or, um, you know, shoes are run in or whatever. There, there's no baseline. There's no um, agreed upon standard for measuring against that baseline. And there's no recognition of the extension of use as something that goes into CDP calculations or various other you know, international bodies. So, um, so that began a campaign for us at Stuffster, kind of working with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to, to try to get that baseline in place and get that going. And so last year, um, we were able to do what's called a co-project within the Circular Economy 100 of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And, um, and be able to bring a number of major players, so Amazon, Target, Walmart, various others, into a, um, an early attempt to define how to set these, these baselines and how to get the measurement against those baselines. And so um, that has now evolved into a project called Project Wherever, that's being um, run by the Sustainability Consortium out of Arizona. Um, and, that's a critically, critically important step because until we really get those measurements in place, we're able to set those baselines and, and get industry agreement on how to measure against them. It's really, really hard to get benefit for any player in extending the use of things. Um, so, you know, we're thrilled that that project now has funding and is really moving forward and is very aggressively testing various technologies for measuring how much someone's actually wearing a shirt and, and you know, literally tagging those shirts and seeing how much people are wearing them around during the day. Um, and so I think it's, it's in motion now, but, you know, that's still gonna be a few years before we really have the data necessary to measure the impact the way we need to measure it. Thank you, thanks so much. We're, we're just coming up to the end of the session, but I have to ask one last question that has come to mind, um, which is really around the kind of, you know, we talk a lot about the environmental impact, but I think there's also a huge potential for these models to drive a positive social impact, especially around the area of inclusive or decent work, because this is for a large part, especially let's say in the work that you do, uh, Jeff, at the Renewal Workshop, it's a lot of handwork, it's a lot of skilled labor. There are people needed to run these, um, to run these models on the back end. And you've just set up your second facility or setting up in Amsterdam. And so maybe very briefly, could you tell us anything about how you see that potential for social impact? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. And we take, we love that part of our job is we're, we, we see this, up, we're creating these circular economy jobs now. And so, you know, green jobs, whatever you call it, it's, 
incredibly um, interesting work to bring manufacturing um, jobs uh, and these kind of sewing jobs back to domestic markets, which um, have for so long sent them overseas. And we are finding um, a really interesting people that have these skill sets coming back to be able to use these skills and, and, um, and do this work in these domestic markets. And we're actually, it's actually really challenging. It's really hard to find this kind of worker, but when we do, it's incredibly rewarding for us to be able to offer this kind of um, opportunity. And so what we see is the business model makes sense for circularity, for the renewal, re redevelopment, refurbishment of products to happen in the domestic market where they actually are. Doesn't make sense to load them on a boat, send them overseas, refurbish them cheaply and get them back into the US or Europe. So the circular economy is actually going to create really cool, interesting new jobs in the manufacturing sector for um, a whole, for the sort of like whole um, growth of this industry. So we're excited to be a part of it and we're super excited to be doing it in Amsterdam too. So that's um, yeah. yeah, a great opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, we have a program here in Circular Economy on jobs and skills. And of course, how do you train, you know, the future workforce for these roles that are up and coming? Because a lot of this handwork, this craft work has been lost in the interim years. And um, we need to get that back. We need to make sure it's flourishing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much everyone for uh, joining us and also to all of the audience and the listeners who've been sending questions which some of which we got to answer not all um yeah this is only you know a small snippet of uh the kind of conversation that we're having in the switching gear project and so if you are interested to stay in touch with the work that's happening through that project or if you're interested to join uh, the enabling network then please uh, get in contact with us over the Circle Economy website or the Switching Gear uh, website. And well, just a final thanks to all of our panelists from joining from all corners of the world. <laughs> and uh, with that, we bid you adieu. Thank you very much, Gwen. And thank you so much to all of you at home or in your offices who have been sending in those questions and comments. I hope this session has gone some ways for answering some of those. For me, the point that will stick with me is actually one of the points was made right at the beginning by Gwen, I think, who said this is a market that's projected to double and it just feels like innovators and new people are popping up in this space all the time. So if you're sitting at home, this could, and you're a designer or entrepreneur, uh, this is a spot that's really worth looking at. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on the diff. This is day three of five. There's loads more to come. You can see everything that's already been on the thinkdiff.co website. If you love fashion, there's a great session coming up at five uh, with an innovator who's actually doing this as well. And there's also a session tomorrow about a need for a new narrative for fashion at one o'clock GMT. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you again very soon on The Diff.